Thank you, Phil. Here is my uh, disclosure. Um, so, uh, first of all, let me tell you that uh, I will um, talk mostly about a, a mechan the methods of the Diabetes Surgery Summit Consensus Conference uh, and then briefly talk about the recommendations that uh, came from this meeting. But you can read more about this by um, taking these two papers, one in, um, in a medical journal that has basically reviewed the entire literature about uh, surgery for diabetes as it was done at the DSS, the Diabetes Surgery Summit, and also the actual paper on analysis of surgery, which is coming up next month uh, with the uh, guidelines and the methods of the con uh, conference. Let me talk to you about the background uh, of this uh, conference. First of all, there is a, an increasing um, uh, consensus that the existing NIH guidelines are uh, probably outdated today. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the same document in 1991, where the uh, NIH uh, published those guidelines, they did recognize that uh, the statement uh, they were publishing was possibly already outdated because it was generated uh, over the past uh, five years. And so they were definitely already implicating that there was a need for uh, update of those guidelines. Uh, 20 years have passed and this has not uh, happened. Uh, meanwhile, however, changes in bariatric surgery have uh, occurred, and these uh, uh, changes are quite, uh, quite dramatically. Some operations have been abandoned, some others have been introduced, but most importantly, the advent of laparoscopic surgery has uh, uh, increased the safety of these operations. So what we're doing today is one of the uh, safest form of uh, general surgery that is around. Uh, with mortality rates that are approached those of uh, uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomies. In addition, there is a, a, a development of a better uh, understanding of the mechanism by which these operations improve diabetes. None of these things were there at the time of the NIH consensus conference. In, a, uh, in addition to those two common, uh, considerations, uh, David has already discussed the um, uh, specific anti-diabetic effects of gastrointestinal surgery, which provides an important uh, point, actually a rational, for considering surgery as a treatment for diabetes itself, as opposed to uh, as, for, as a treatment of obesity. The uh, mechanism has been elucidated ever since the, um, have not been elucidated in, in the details, the mechanism I, uh, I was trying to say, but nevertheless, there is quite um, a, growing, uh, a growing body of evidence that does uh, uh, corroborate the knowledge that there is something more than just weight loss in uh, the improvement of diabetes that we see after those operations. Ever since the first report of the duodenal jejunal bypass uh, uh, showing um, a direct anti-diabetic effect in rats, similar studies using the same procedures have been reported by others, and an equivalent number of uh, papers have come out over the last few years uh, um, investigating the role of gastro bypass operation, ileal interposition in rat models as well as in humans, uh, uh, corroborating that uh, idea that some uh, effects on diabetes might be unrelated uh, to the weight loss mechanism of these procedures. But most importantly, at this stage, there are opportunities uh, and limitations as well as risks to be considered when we uh, look at a novel approach to diabetes, especially if you think that this is a global, worldwide epidemic. There is more damage to do if uh, this is an epidemic that uh, affects millions and millions of, patient, of patients. And there's much more caution to exert in innovating in this field because if something is not uh, going well, it's going to be multiplied by the millions. So you really have to exert a, a lot of caution in uh, considering uh, surgery for diabetes. Uh, this is an excellent um, cartoon by Dr. Porius that I think summarizes very well what uh, uh, it is our dilemma today. We have an opportunity to do uh, good things but we need to do that uh, without causing harm. On the other hand, uh, existing algorithms for the treatment of type 2 diabetes do not, at least until recently, and Sue will tell us more about this, at least until recently, do, uh, the algorithm of uh, diabetes treatment did not consider surgery at any time uh, for patients with diabetes. And I would suggest that patients who are morbidly obese with diabetes, they are diabetic patients, of course. So they've been treated by surgery for many years, 
and with excellent outcomes. So at some point in that algorithm, surgery should at least appear, maybe if, not, if nothing else, as a tertiary uh, type of uh, uh, treatment. As uh, David uh, liked to uh, portray this situation, we are basically talking about two sides of the same coin. On one side, there is an increased use uh, of surgery even in patients who do not um, represent ideal candidates for bariatric surgery according to current guidelines. And of course, we still don't have enough data for the long-term safety and efficacy of these procedures. But on the other side, because of the dramatic effect on diabetes, one could definitely uh, say that there is a potential to treat and, uh, many more patients than we're doing today and improve their lives. So we thought, we started to think that a, cons a, a consensus conference on surgical treatment for diabetes was necessary. It was, it, uh, this was necessary now rather than later. Why now? Why now? Because uh, it's true that there is not much evidence to uh, base this consensus conference on. But on the other side, if we had definitive evidence-based, uh, the first ev line of evidence-based uh, knowledge, th would that be uh, need? Would, it, would there be a need for a consensus conference for guidance, uh, uh, expert guidance uh, at that stage? Perhaps the moment in which you need more than any uh, other time expert guidance is when the evidence is not yet uh, first uh, 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 level one. It's actually when a lot of, uh, of the experience so far is still uh, um, early and anecdotal, etc. How do we deal with the potential and, and, and risk and how do we shape the future of this field so that it becomes a scientifically solid and respectable uh, field? On the other uh, hand, if there is a need for a consensus conference, who should convene it? The NIH? Uh, well, of course, it would be a, a natural candidate. But on the other side, the NIH um, probably didn't have any uh, plan to do so uh, at this stage. And also, would NIH represent the rest of the uh, planet? Diabetes is a global epidemic. And the problems that diabetes poses are sometimes uh, country-specific. Would the NIH have the interest and capability to address all those issues? What about specific diabetes societies, like the American Diabetes Association, the European Diabetes Association, or the International Diabetes Federation? Certainly, they would be credible organizations to carry on a, a conference like this. But at the same time, do they have the necessary 360-week comprehensive expertise uh, to address this issue? Do they have surgeons among their members? And none of them would. Uh, and I think that definitely has a drawback in terms of credibility. How can you impose new ru uh, rules and new regulations to a different field if you don't have uh, a way to reach out to them um, quite uh, consistently? What about surgical societies, on the other hand? Of course, how could a surgical society have the expertise about diabetes when diabetes has never been an issue for uh, surgeons other than uh, for the complications that are related to these procedures, and, and so forth? Who basically should be doing that? So that was our, one of the, uh, our concerns. Of course, if you envision a conf consensus conference for the treatment of diabetes by surgery, you have to make sure that this consensus conference is representative enough of all the diverse expertise that is necessary to address the issue, and also that all stakeholders are represented in that conference. Uh, what about the timing? That was another issue. Though a lot of uh, other organizations, as I said, could potentially be uh, interested or at least uh, certainly credible in, in, in some, uh, for some aspects, on the other hand, it was probably not in their plans, in their agenda as a priority to, establish, to make a conference of this type. But of course, as I said before, we needed guidelines and recommendations today and not tomorrow. So with that in mind, we did realize that none of the existing organizations alone would or could possibly do a conference of this type. So with uh, uh, the help of uh, uh, three colleagues, and I think with the enthusiasm uh, and perhaps um, the naive approach of uh, uh, young or children, uh, uh, we did think that that potentially cyclopic uh, effort was feasible somehow. I was told by one of my senior colleagues 
at the time that there was no way a conference like this could be put together. And I think Phil, David, Lee, and myself uh, were challenged by this. And I think we took uh, with the enthusiasm of our children, as I show in this picture, uh, and eventually I think we can say it was something feasible indeed and maybe worthwhile. But okay, we had decided to do the conference and then we were <laughs> facing another big problem. How do we do it? Who, whoever did a consensus conference uh, among us. So we realized that was not, was not our uh, primary uh, expertise to organize a consensus conference. And as uh, uh, anybody would do, the first thing we did was to read about how to do a consensus conference. There is a lot of literature there, methods are very well defined, and so that's what we did. We also called in an expert panel of advisors that were not involved in the voting uh, of the uh, recommendations, but they did provide some assistance in understanding what model we should be using for this consensus conference. And I will not get into too many details of types of consensus conference. There are three of them primarily. One of uh, uh, the number three is, co is called Consensus Development Conference, uh, which was uh, um, basically developed by the NIH in 1977. We had many criteria to keep in mind, the size. For instance, the number of, patient, of uh, voting experts should have been consistent with the uh, need of having comprehensive expertise at uh, hand. The authority of the uh, experts voting should be uh, widely and worldwide recognized. And also, of course, we had to have a scientific credibility for those methods, uh, as well as for the uh, panel that was uh, uh, issuing those recommendations themselves. Among the aims that I will not mention in details, there was basically uh, the uh, purpose of uh, creating recommendations that not only um, indicate what uh, should be done clinically, but also what should be done in terms of research to make sure that this field grows according to sound scientific uh, criteria. We uh, decided that uh, 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 the panel of experts for this uh, consensus conference should be made by endocrinologists, gastroenterologists with relevant scholarship, the surgeons, of course, with relevant expertise, diabetologists, especially with uh, experts in diabetes research methods, and uh, other uh, endocrinology experts, including basic scientists. Uh, the, there was a need also to have surgeons who practically do these operations, especially novel operations that were, that were under our radar to make sure that uh, these operations are done according to scientific criteria. We also invited health economic experts, the, uh, epidemiologists and public health uh, representatives. We also had clinical trial specialists in the group and representatives of pertinent societies with presidents of, the, of many societies, including the American Diabetes Association and, uh, and many journals, medical journals in the field. In the end, we ended up with a big size uh, voting panel. I think um, I, it, it's probably safe to say that it's one of the biggest uh, panel, uh, panels ever um, organized for a, a consensus conference. 52 uh, experts or faculty, if you will, 60% of them non-surgeons, 40% surgeons. There was an intentional bias in weighing this panel towards non-surgeons due to the potential conflict of interest of our category in this uh, field. 93% were university-based and none of them uh, were involved in uh, uh, industry. This is um, uh, the uh, group picture, you may recognize many of them. Uh, and uh, most uh, relevantly, the uh, methods of this conference were um, I think sound uh, enough that many societies uh, uh, that were uh, in, informed about our intention and to which we disclosed our methods and the name of the uh, people involved decided that it was the right time and the right way to do that consensus conference. So we had 21 uh, societies, including medical and surgical societies, that gave endorsement to the concept of that uh, meeting. It was a very complex uh, uh, type of uh, uh, undertaking. Uh, it was not just uh, sitting together and making recommendations. It started with the um, co organizing planning committee, uh, reviewing the literature, um, creating synopsis, and sending this material to the experts prior to the face-to-face -face meeting. Then there was a face-to-face -face meeting in Rome uh, on March uh, 2007. I will not go through this business slides, but it's only to, to show that uh, the process is very complicated. You, create, you review the evidence, you discuss the strength of the evidence, you start drafting some statements, uh, you have a first 
initial vote about the um, approval for those statements, and you refine the statements until you maximize agreement on each of them. And the consensus was eventually defined as more than uh, acceptance, but at least two-thirds of the voting uh, panels. But that means not that uh, the con uh, there was consensus uh, at that stage and we stopped at that level. We always try to maximize to as near as possible to 100% of the panel for each individual statement. After the Rome's meeting, the things didn't finish. We started to draft the documents according to the uh, statement that achieved consensus. We distributed the document to each and every of the voting panels. We got further input and the new draft was distributed to a number of scientific societies that have relevant uh, interest in the field. And we invited uh, official representatives of these societies at the first World Congress on Interventional Therapies in New York City, where there was a special session for discussion of the uh, draft document from the DSS. The discussion of this document has been used to uh, provide further input into those guidelines. And so eventually, we uh, decided to uh, finalize a position statement that was once again distributed to some societies that have the ability to endorse. Uh, the um, final position statement has been endorsed by, so far, by uh, five different societies, the American Bari Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, IFSO, the Obesity Society, the International Association for the Study of Obesity, and also by Diabetes UK. And of course, we are seeking uh, additional endorsement. Briefly, uh, the guidelines that came out from this meeting. One is, uh, reads that uh, gastrointestinal surgery, including Roux and Y gastro bypass, gastric bending, and biliopancreatic diversion should be considered for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in acceptable surgical candidates and BM with BMI uh, over 35, especially if they are inadequately controlled by medical therapy. A more controversial, but certainly a step forward in clinical indication is the second statement saying that a surgical approach uh, may also be appropriate as a non-primary alternative to treat inadequately controlled patients with type 2 diabetes and BMI between 30 and 35. In this setting, Rouen Y gastro bypass may be the uh, more, uh, most appropriate surgical option. Although novel uh, gastrointestinal procedures are promising, the panel believes that those operations, including duodenal jejunal bypass, ileal interposition, sleeve gastrectomy, should only be performed in the context of IRB approved and registered uh, clinical trials. We also called for uh, improvement of reporting in this arena uh, with standard of diabetic, uh, diabetes uh, um, outcomes to be uh, looked at and reported uh, carefully. And this has not been the case in uh, bariatric surgery. Importantly, the DSS also indicated um, recommendations for research, for further research. I would like you to emphasize that uh, the panel agreed on the fact uh, with 100% uh, consensus that in patients with BMI below 35, determining the appropriate use of gastrointestinal surgery for diabetes is an important research priority. And that, of course, research should be used to uh, find new parameters to identify the appropriate patient uh, for surgery as opposed to BMI as it is today. We also emphasize the uh, importance of animal studies for mechanistic purposes. And uh, uh, an important statement that I want to uh, emphasize is this, which I believe represents the foundation of diabetes surgery, is that there are certain operations that involve anti-diabetic mechanisms that are not only weight-related. Uh, we also uh, emphasize the collaboration between endocrinology surgeons and other scientists and the DSS called for the establishment of an international task force that should promote these guidelines, collaborate with existing societies, not against existing societies, and trying to put forward the uh, 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 recommendations of the DSS in the hope that we can improve the standards of uh, this new field. So finally, I want to conclude that I don't think we have reached the end of a chapter, but we are clearly at the beginning of a new one. But it's critical that this new chapter is um, actually started and grows with a, a sound uh, scientific criteria. And it's the responsibility of all of us. And I hope you can pass this message of all the surgeons to ensure that we follow cl clinical uh, in, uh, recommendations that are consistent with the available evidence without uh, moving too fast and too far. Thank you very much.